We can only deal with so much bad news at a time. And appealing to and engaging this emotional sy system works in a very short term, but then our attention shifts. And uh, an example of this is like when you give a talk about climate change, people are all worked up and excited about it uh, and did have all the good intentions. The next day, their company announces that they are downsizing. And of course, that's not on a uh, family father's mind anymore. It climate is changing. So there are much more immediate needs and concerns. Um, similarly, um, with terrorist attacks, they can very often, uh, like if there was another terrorist attack on uh, US, um, in the US, it would shift uh, our concern uh, about climate change, uh, which is already really low, or concern about the economy in, in different ways. Um, along those same lines, um, the effect of worry can also lead to emotional uh, numbing, which occurs after repeated exposure to emotionally draining uh, um, situations. And um, as most of us know, um, after the 9-11 attacks, uh, the subway system or uh, New York City had like a, a warning system with like a, coded, a color coded warning system and we were in orange and red for a very long time but only for the first week or month did people think about oh I can't take the subway we're in state red or orange after a month you say well I need to go on with my life and you, this, this numbing the orange and red doesn't mean anything anymore and nobody even checks anymore what uh, level of, uh, uh, of alert or warning we're, we're at. Um, so this, this effect of worry wears off. I think, as a, I think we need to caution, we should not overuse the emotional appeals because of these downsides. Um, so what should we do? Um, I would suggest a, a balanced combination of the analytic and the effective experience-based information uh, that's appropriate for the audience and tailored. And I'm gonna illustrate this by the following example about glacial retreat. Um, this is a chart of some 20 uh, glaciers that have uh, retreated over uh, the last 500 years and um, not all glaciers have data available for all of them, but the general picture is uh, a major decline uh, for most of them. Um, but who, who's going to engage with this? this uh, um, the expert, yes, um, but the general public, no. What can we do? We can try to find imagery and then find this year from 1984, uh, finding that, find this glacier, Mount Hood, Oregon, uh, map it on this, on this chart on the left, and then show what 100 meters of glacial retreat looks like in a picture, and then map it onto, onto this chart. Now we have someone engaged. Oh, this is what 100 meters of glacial retreat looks like. Then we can ask, uh, maybe it's someone, an elderly person, to tell the story of their 80, 90 years experience of living near this glacier and explain the decline uh, shown in a little chart next to her. We can then also show what impact does this have downstream on agriculture and, uh, and yields uh, downstream from the glacier for people who depend on this water. What does it mean, mean for the uh, water resources and the um, water availability for children living downstream uh, of the glaciers. Now we have people interested and engaged, and we can, they might want to find out why are glaciers retreating, and we can show them the Mona Loa curve and temperature increase maps. And then they might be interested in learning, well, is this going to continue? Is this a trend? What does it look like um, by the time I'm 80 years old? Um, so this would be one way to engage both systems, which will leave a mark in multiple parts in our brain, the emotional side might be lost and replaced by another worry that comes up, but there's another place in our brain where, where a mark has been left behind and there's this balance and combined information available to people. Um, um, so, okay, let me, uh, real quick, um, let's assume that we now have overcome a lot of the barriers, we're used to right communication, we have motivated people to cooperate in their group. Um, we have to be careful not to run in an, into another phenomenon that's called um, the single action bias. And that's illustrated in this cartoon, uh, which shows that um, CFLs are a great first step, but very, very often people leave it at that. And there's no follow-up. Um, uh, activity or behavior that, that comes after that. And why is that? Um, 
When we're in risk situations, once we have taken one action to deal with the risk, um, such as climate change, we tend to stop right there because our, vulnerability, our sense of vulnerability has been reduced, uh, or our feeling of worry has been reduced. And so we only take one action even if there's a wide range of actions and a portfolio of actions necessary. Um, we've seen this in research with farmers who have a multitude of uh, options um, that they can take in order to, uh, to protect their crops or to, uh, to have higher yields. Uh, and very often they only take one action either related to production, to production practice or to pricing practice or to the endorsement of government interventions. Uh, we found with farmers in Argentina who, if they said that they had uh, resources for crane storage, they did not invest in long-term in irrigation projects or in crop insurance. Um, so, and even trained experts run into this problem. Uh, there are studies um, of radiologists who, um, after uh, studying um, uh, X-ray images, once they find one abnormality, they stop and do not look for any further lesions. And this is, tra I mean, this is traumatic, and radiologists are currently being trained. Uh, and one, one way to do this, like to get, to get beyond um, this bias, is like making people aware of it. That is one very, very first step. And when we give talks to people about climate change, we should um, um, tell people about that. Like people usually say, oh yeah, that's right, I do this, I do this all the time. And you can ask people, uh, how many of you uh, turn off their lights when they leave the room? But you get a lot of like show of hands. It's like, how many people uh, turn off their computer at night? Uh, or unplug your laptop, you get another show of hands, and then you ask how many people turn off their lights in the room and turn off their computer at night, and then you can add more items to that, and you get like a smaller and smaller uh, number of people who are able to raise their hands to, to say that they, that they do a combination of these activities. So awareness, I think, can, can, can lead to a lot of things and reminders. Uh, we should promote a multitude of solutions that is available, a portfolio of tasks, and then put checklists in prominent places where people see them. Um, but I don't think we'll be completely able to get rid of this uh, uh, single action bias. And if we know that, we can take advantage of this. And it's like if we know that people will do at least one thing, let's promote something that will have the greatest energy conservation effect. And most people don't know what that is. Um, so um, we need to remind people that CFL, if they only do one thing, putting the light bulbs in may not be the most effective way. And this is the sign to start with my conclusions. <laughs> um, one could take a pessimist view and say, we constantly make decisions that are not good for us. Um, we don't choose what's ultimately good um, to the benefit um, of society or even to us. Um, we don't make good decisions in the long term. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. If we have to tailor every message to every audience, this is a task that cannot be done. Um, we could take this pessimist view. We can take an optimist view and say we can improve the communication of climate change information. Um, and we have seen that good behavior can be learned. Uh, and nudges work. Uh, we can shape people to take behaviors that are in their best, uh, in their best interest and in societal best interest. Uh, we can promote cooperation by appealing to group uh, affiliation, uh, as we have seen in the experiment that I discussed. Um, and we can and we have to involve stakeholders early in this process uh, through participatory processes um, so that our information falls on open ears and we know that this information makes sense. Um, and I'm the person who likes to take the posit positive view uh, and especially inspired by uh, last night's um, talk um, that Paul gave us and uh, the exercise that, I, that he led us through. And, um, but at the same time, I also want to say behavior the behavior wedge, and I want to call them behavior wedges, because there's not just one wedge, there's multiple behavior wedges, are not meant to substitute uh, or to be an alternative to a lot of the other strategies that we're trying to put in place. They are supplement uh, to other initiatives, and we need to work on this as a whole. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.